This may come as a shock to some of you in the void, but this is not my first channel. CoffeeZilla was not my first channel. I've actually been making content for 10 years now, and I wanted to reflect on that. I'm actually a little bit late to my anniversary, but um, I think it's still within that window of where it's relevant. I've been reflecting on what I learned, all the phases you go through, because what kind of is interesting or relevant to me now maybe wasn't relevant to me five years in or seven years in. I would just want to reflect where I'm at at this particular moment, share what I've learned. Maybe it's useful to you. Maybe it's not either way. Um, but I don't know if you know, the story kind of starts in college. I was not at all interested in what I was studying. I was going to become a chemical engineer like my uncle, like my grandpa, and I wasn't excited about it. I was not excited to, you know, improve efficiencies by 1%. I wanted a voice. Maybe it's like middle child syndrome or something, but um, I always wanted to have a place to talk to people, a, a platform, if you will. <laughs> Cringe, right? But um, so I started making some music uh, you know, I'd play piano, so I'd record myself playing piano, I'd post it to YouTube, kind of with this vague dream. I just really didn't even know what I was doing at that point. I just knew I may want to do this in the future. Maybe I'll throw some stuff out in the void. Go figure, here we are still doing that. Um, and, and see if it sticks, right? See if anyone's interested. Now, no one was, to be clear. For good reason, those videos were terrible. There was so much wrong, and I had no idea. But it didn't really matter. The point was I was getting experience, which brings me to my first lesson I feel like I've learned after 10 years on YouTube, which is you. it takes longer than you think to get good at something, but you can get better than you think over time. Like what I was imagining at the time was basically I like those YouTubers. I'm going to try to become that. So at the time I was watching those videos or I was making piano videos. I was watching Kyle Landry. I wanted to be... Kyle or like that person. Then I started, you know, when I got into my coffee break era of making more like video essays, you know, then I'm looking at Zay Frank, Vlog Brothers, Nerd, you know, these different people, right? And um and at the time your imagination sort of never goes beyond um never goes beyond just like, oh, that looks cool. I want to it never occurs to you you can do something different. You can um you can kind of chart your own path. You're just thinking. So, but it also takes you way longer to do, like to even get a decent video out there. Like it just does. You don't know what's interesting. You don't know how to capture people's attention. You don't know what people care about. You don't know how to think about an audience. You don't know how to think about packaging content. You don't know how to think about stories. Um, all of this stuff, you have to learn to put on so many hats as a YouTuber that, when, when I went in, I'm almost grateful that I had a bit of a naive view of things. I wasn't thinking about monetizing anything. I wasn't thinking about, I didn't really care. I just was new. Okay, I kind of want a voice. Um, maybe this <laughs> online video stuff is the way to do it. And, uh, and eventually, obviously, I moved from piano, making piano videos. I started doing like these uh, kind of video essays. And at the time, my idea of production value was taking clips from movies, other things and laying my voice underneath that. I thought I was 10,000 IQ. I was like, this fair use thing lets me cheat out some production quality because if I clip up enough things next to each other, I'm not really taking any part of one. I'm just sort of creating this remix, which I can call my own. Anyways, uh, since then we've kind of moved on to um, bigger productions, but that was sort of my idea. So I then make coffee break videos. I then eventually moved to Coffee Silla. But it's important to know, like when I talk about things take longer than you think, I think I got in the first 100 videos, which now are almost all private, I think this is when I was making piano videos. I think I had less than 100 subscribers. It's been so long now. It's been like seven years ago, but um, or eight years ago. I, I don't know how long it took me to make 100 videos. I think two or three years and less than 100 subscribers. Then I make coffee break. I get that many subscribers in a much shorter amount of time. And then in the next three years, I think I got something like 100,000 subscribers or something like that, or maybe 300,000. And then in the following three years, so first three years, 
just like 100 subscribers or something like that. Next three years, 100,000 or a few hundred thousand. In the following three years, 3 million. I don't think that's accidental. I mean, I think a lot of this stuff is exponential. Um, if you can manage to stick with it, I think that is one of the main challenges of YouTube is kind of grinding it out. You have to have not only the will to do it, you also have to have the means to do it. At the time, I was um, living off of mostly engineering internship money. Uh, also, at the time, I had a long-term relationship, which ultimately uh, became my wife, where she was starting to make some money. So that financially helped us out when I was making absolutely zero. So I had things in my life that sort of let me experiment, which was very fortunate. And I think a reason that I was able to kind of stick around while I built up those skills. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just want to say, I think like the idea of, and I don't know if any of this is coherent, but when I started YouTube, I kind of thought, oh, it's kind of luck. You just kind of have this outside thing, which is the algorithm. And if you can just get lucky enough for the algorithm to recognize you, now all these eyeballs are just automatically on you, which equals success. That is basically wrong. I mean, it's the idea of a single video making an entire career is um, not very common. It's not something that's <laughs> that true. Uh, obviously, people go viral for very incredibly stupid things. However, that's not that never really leads to long term kind of longevity or anything like that. And what I discovered is actually it was the skills that I built up over the years of like just trying stuff, which led me to be able to um, more predictably create stuff that people want to watch, if that makes sense. I mean, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, I think it's worth saying that because my conception at the time was, oh, I just have to try stuff until I get lucky. You know, that was my initial kind of thinking about YouTube. And it was totally wrong. I guess the second lesson I learned, so that was a long, long lesson. Uh, but the second thing I learned was number chasing is very unsatisfying. So initially, I was very driven by external metrics. Not really for anything other than it just kind of was a good, easy goal. It was an easy proxy for quality. I just thought, well, as I get better, I get more views. And I get more views and number goes up and I feel good. So that was my main goal. And at the time, I kind of had this idea my main goal was, okay, I'll get to a million subscribers and then I'll be happy. <laughs> and then, and then I will be success. I will be Mr. Success Man. Um, then we hit a million subscribers and I, I watched the number and I saw it tick over to a million and I go, oh, okay, uh, cool. So now what? <laughs> uh, tale as old as time, just hitting goals and hitting like numbers is inherently just not that interesting. And um, I had to recalibrate, especially as I hit a lot of external metrics and those things, which were such good carrots to kind of motivate me, were not making me like feel a sense of um, achievement. Because then what am I going to do after you get to a million? Do you just, once you realize that wasn't actually that great, do you then put 10 million to be the goal and try to trick yourself into thinking, oh, it's going to be awesome if I hit. It's going to be the same thing. So I recalibrated myself to go away from, and I don't know if this is right, okay? I'm not saying this is advice for you guys. I'm just reflecting on my own thinking. I recalibrated to move away from views and subscribers being the thing that I'm interested in to try to think about the qualitative stuff, move from quantitative to qualitative. So Am I making work that I'm proud of? Am I making a difference? Am I qualitatively, am I happy with where my content is? Uh, it's a, it takes a while to change your thinking about this because in a real way, qualitative stuff is harder to measure. But at the same time, I think it is more gratifying in the end, personally. Uh, number three, authenticity. Everybody's heard that word. Oh, you got to be authentic on YouTube. You got to be authentic. I think, I think I realized, you know, over 10 years that authenticity is really misunderstood by people who make content because 
people understand the aesthetics of it. They understand when they see authenticity, they, they can feel it. You know, you go, I feel like this guy's being honest. He's being truthful. But then they try to replicate it as a form of success. So they're like, oh, I just have to be authentic. I will just, and it's like trying to force yourself to be funny or be happy. Um, and I found a lot of authenticity is just knowing what you believe about something and believing it strongly or, you know, having a real opinion. You know, I felt like when CoffeeZilla started getting some traction, it actually, even though we've done a bunch of stuff around production and stuff, I feel like the success of the channel did not come from production value or like, you know, nice cameras, fancy editing. I feel like that's not really, I mean, that's of course helps, but the reality is I just cared about the subjects that I was talking about. I was passionate about it. And I genuinely, if you look, talk to me outside of YouTube, I would have been talking your ear off about that. And I felt like that came through the camera, but it wasn't because I told myself I've got to be authentic now. Um, it was just because I cared about a topic. So I think that was something that was discussed a lot when I was coming up and still is discussed a lot now. You just got to be authentic. But I don't really know if that's that actionable. I would say more, and this is just as generic, I guess, but I just feel like it's a little easier to act on. It would just, just make content you care about, make stuff. You, and if you don't care about anything, then you shouldn't be trying to be like telling yourself, I got to be, you shouldn't force that. Um, you know, find something you're interested in. Uh, number four, fourth lesson, top 10 tips to become YouTuber. Uh, <laughs> so, so, um, obviously this is more personal to me, you know, doing what I do covering fraud. I would say the biggest thing that I see that motivates people to like, you know, pursue scams, stuff like that is they're thinking short term. So, I feel like in general, life rewards people like, well, reward scammers too, but over time, life rewards long-term thinking and it punishes short-term thinking. So this is just a, just a general comment on like YouTube stuff, which is, it kind of goes back to point one, which is if you get into, if I got into this like world of YouTube thinking, ah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna make money. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, all of a sudden, make a make a bag, get famous, whatever. That's short term thinking, and it's like if you're trying to shortcut, you know, I'll just I'll just cheat it real quick. I'll use a hack. I'll use some algorithmic trick to make people watch my video. That's not gonna work. It might work a little bit for a little while, but ultimately people see through it. And if you watch people's careers, it's pretty easy to tell who's playing long term games and who's not. And you want to align yourself with other people who are playing long-term games if possible, which brings me to my next point, which is that um, when you can, if you can, working with other people is super helpful to make a better product. So I, I talk about it. Sometimes, though, people don't hear it, I feel like. I, at CoffeeZilla, we're a team of three. It's not just me. Team of three. Two other people are like full-time people who are working on it. Um, I've got an editor and I've got a CGI master um, that helps put the show together. That has improved the quality to a level I cannot explain to the point where when people just attribute all the success of CoffeeZilla to me, it feels like cheating. It feels like they're not attributing properly because so much of what the show is is actually the soul of two other people being put, you know, 100% into the show. So, um, you know, this goes back to long-term games. Play long-term games with long-term people. Try to align yourself with, if you can, people who um, are interested in playing, like, like building um, quality stuff over time. So the two people I've been with, I think we're going on three years together. Um, I think so. It's also worth saying you don't need a giant team, too. That's also an option. For the first several years of being on YouTube, one, I absolutely could not afford um, hiring anybody. I could barely afford myself. And then um, also, it, I just wasn't ready for it. Like, And I'm still not ready to hire more people. I mean, I kind of feel like there is this pressure because you can grow. There's this idea that you should grow. I don't think that's always true. I think you shouldn't think of YouTube and 
nobody at the summits and stuff like that will tell you this. <laughs> you know how those, the, 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 there's those creator, like, you know, workshops and stuff. Everyone will tell you, you got to think of it like a business. You got to go hire an editor. You got to go. I don't really think of YouTube as a business. Maybe I should. But I think for long term, like longevity, it's actually sort of a bit of both. Yes, there are practical business things to consider, but I think more important is the um, the artistic side, fulfillment, passion, and that drives everything else. I think if you don't have that, you don't really have anything. So if you build a giant team and now you're not doing the things that make you excited, the audience is going to feel that. You're going to, you at home will know that. Uh, so that was a big lesson I learned. I've, um, luckily, I actually had, actually had a call with Mr. Beast about this, where I remember it was right before I hired my editor, I think. I was talking to him and he had like a hundred employees at the time. And I very distinctly remember him telling me, after 10 people, it gets less fun. And he's like, if you do build a team, because I was thinking about it at the time, and um, he goes, if you do build a team, just consider keeping it small because when you get it big, it's less like less spontaneous. I don't know if he still feels that way now, but I remember really holding on to that advice. And I feel like it saved me from making the mistake of trying to scale up a big team and then getting super burnt out. And I think you've actually seen other YouTubers have that happen. Um, I won't name them specifically, but there's been several uh, creators who have been like, hey, I'm scaling back my team. You know, I... This is not making me happy because now I'm focused on meetings and all of this stuff. Uh, anyway, that's very inside baseball. Whatever. Let's move on. Um, let's also talk about... <sighs> Dude, I'm too aware of... I don't want to sound like some kind of YouTube guru, okay? I, pre I hope you guys just take this for what it is, which is just my thoughts. Not It's not advice. It's not some big plan to a successful channel. But um, one thing I've noticed... Now that I'm sort of like, like I talk to other creators, um, a lot of people, and it sort of doesn't matter the success level. Gratitude is a huge problem, you know, when you achieve, um, kind of what I would call like, like where the show is right now, I never would have dreamed. Right. So it's like, and I found myself sometimes not being, uh, like just focused on all these things, these, all the problems. And so um, it wasn't until I heard other creators complaining that I saw it in myself how dumb that was. I, I would see other creators, you know, I'd be talking to them and be like this. Oh, I'm so bummed out about this. I'm so tired of this. I'm so upset with this. And I was thinking, gosh, you sound like a baby. Like your life rocks. And then I realized I do the same thing sometimes. I get caught up in the same you know, ah, uh, what about this month? I don't know. No, have I released as many videos this month? What are my views? Doesn't matter. Be grateful. Um, I'm lucky to be in this position. Incredibly, incredibly lucky. And sometimes it's easy to forget that. So uh, that's also one of those like qualitative things that's kind of easy to forget about, hard to measure. But um, I think gratitude is a huge part of staying in the game and like doing it. And I think that's actually one of my things that I've been thinking about, which is not how do I do, how do I get more number? How do what I, I, more of my focus is now, how do I do this for as long as possible and enjoy it? How do I enjoy this thing? Whatever it is, whatever form it takes, whether it's in the void, whether it's in CoffeeZilla, how do I enjoy what I'm doing and just have a good time until I can't have a good time any longer. But how, yeah, how do I enjoy it as much as possible for as long as possible? So that's where like a lot of my thinking is now. I think if you asked me a few years ago, my thinking would have been more focused on building, growing, da da da. And now I don't know what it is, but definitely my thinking around that has changed. Um, okay. Number eight. I think I'm on number eight. I wrote a little document here. I put a little points. Uh, so maybe this is number eight. Okay. This point, I just wrote this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this. Loving it is focus. Focus is everything. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't know if it does. It sounds like a bumper sticker. Loving it is... Uh, what I mean by this, guys, it's very serious. I feel like most of um, achievement can be boiled down to intense focus over a long period of time. 
and most achievements that are worthwhile i'll say that whether in the like in relationships whether in scholastic achievements or whether in work and so continued focus but in order to focus at least for me for my brain i have to love what i'm focusing on or i could not care less this was my problem with engineering actually it's that i could always do the math i could do the like the technical side of it i just didn't care about it and i kind of knew that that would torpedo any chance of a you know meaningful um achievement in that field because i just was like i don't know if i can even care enough to focus on this i'm just going to be slacking off all the time i always did slack off at you know the the small little roles i had um, working as interns or whatever. I just played ping pong most of the time, to be, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, so loving it is focus and focus is everything. I, I still don't know if that makes sense. Anyway. Uh, all right. Point nine. Let's talk about fame. The thing everybody wants. It's not, it's not great. It's not. So I don't even have real fame. I've got like Z list every now and then, you know, at a seven 11, someone will be like, are you Nah, you know, that's, that's, that's what we get here at Coffee Zilla. Uh, but it's not that cool. I don't know why people want, want fame. It's like totally baffling to me. Um, in the sense of what people think of as fame, the part about, you know, I can put out my thoughts and I feel like it's validated or, or seen or heard. Very cool. I do appreciate that. I mean, I'm not going to lie. But the part where people think of like fame is like you're recognized or people see you in real life and they go, hey, let's talk to you. I love you, dude. I've never found that that interesting. I always find it actually a little awkward and weird when somebody comes to you. Hey, you know, it's always flattering, but it's the flattery is way outweighed by how awkward and random it always feels and just like kind of like. I don't know you. I, uh, you know me. I appreciate, like, you don't want to be real. It's, it, this sounds like complaining. I'm not complaining, but it's just not, it's not that interesting. And I don't know why people are, if I could have it my way, the only time like CoffeeZilla would be relevant in my life is like posting videos, people seeing the videos. Not really interested in anything beyond that. It's just kind of, I like existing online and then I like having my friends and family outside of that. And I like them completely separated. I do not want them connected. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. I feel like this is more of a personal opinion. This is like less generally applicable. I think this will be more interesting, less interesting to different people. My personality don't love it. Um, and again, the level we're talking about is very low. So I feel like if I don't like it at this point, I can't imagine people who go seek it out and go to like cities where that's, you know, really a thing. Um, I don't get it. Okay. Number 10. And this is, goes back to my point of why this could never be kind of a guide, which is, and this, I definitely haven't been through 10 points. I think I've been through nine or eight. I don't know. Anyway, luck plays a huge role. Yes. I worked hard. Yes. I cared about this. I grinded. And I think skill has a huge role to play in vi in videos um, like taking off, right? I think when um, creators who are big say, if I could start it all over, I'd, I'd be successful still. It's like, yeah, because you have the skill. But the fact you were able to accumulate all that knowledge and all that um, kind of take all that time to develop something and get the equipment, that is luck. So... For me personally, like the luck was for me was right after, so right after college, I was doing this engineering thing. Um, it was basically when, when stuff started working for me um, because I had been doing YouTube for a long time and nothing was working. That was really discouraging. And right about the time where I was thinking, I'm going to have to figure something else out. That's when just enough happened to keep me on the treadmill which ultimately led to everything. Uh, so I got a couple sort of, I don't know, you'd consider it viral at the time, viral hits probably early into my like coffee break channel, maybe a few months, six months maybe or so, seven months maybe uh, into it. 
And that was at a time where I was like running out of, you know, money to float on. I was getting an, uh, a job to support myself while still trying to do YouTube and getting that was luck. I mean, I was not that was not like, you know, I crafted this video. I knew it was going to be successful. I just tried something. It got lucky. And then I kind of kept at it. And once I kept at it long enough, I was able to kind of figure out what I had done, figure out what was working. And then it all kind of snowballed from there. But um, that was a huge, like you can't take out that part of it, the luck component of it. I think that goes for everyone on YouTube. You can always point back to some breaks they got or lack of things going wrong in their life for why they were able to ultimately like sort of make it. Uh, so yeah, that's 10 years of YouTube. <laughs> I hope this has been enlightening or maybe maybe even interesting. I don't know. Uh, this is obviously not advice for you to go do the same thing because as I said, luck plays a huge role. It's not a very replicable path. And a lot of people don't even like the video making side of it. They like the idea of it, which is not the same thing. And really, I would argue the only people who should become YouTubers are people who just find a need to make content anyways, and they just want to try stuff. And I, I think that's a great place to start. So that's basically it. Uh, hope you enjoyed a little trip down memory lane, and I'll see you in the next one.